morning again, Redeemer. It's good to be back with you uh, in Ephesians. If you're new to us, we've been working through the book of Ephesians. We are going to look at one verse this morning, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. And uh, let me pray for us. I'll read it and I'll pray for us and then we'll jump right in. Ephesians 4, verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let's pray. Our Father, your word is beautiful. May we see the wonderful things in your law. Your word is a lamp and a light. Your word guards us and it keeps us from stumbling into sin. Your word exposes the errors and the sin in our hearts. Your word drives us to a need for Christ. Your word was obeyed perfectly by your son and he is our righteousness. And those who have been redeemed by the son can approach your law as something that is beautiful, something that you will use to conform us back to your image. And so we tread lightly and we tread with humility and pray that you would speak to your people as we handle the sacred things of God. Would you show us yourself and show us your glory? Would you show us how sweet and beautiful Jesus is? And would you show us how we might grow up into him who is the head through the word? We pray for his sake. Amen. If you're visiting with us, we're in Ephesians chapter four and we'll be making our way through Ephesians chapter four and chapter five. And just to kind of go briefly and kind of look at what we've uncovered in Ephesians chapter one and two, Paul basically makes the case that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But God, according to his great mercy and great love, has made us alive in Christ, that we have been saved apart from our works that another has come in our place to obey and to rescue us and to die for our sins and to impute his righteousness to us. But the lives of those of us who are born again, that that one of the things that God does do is point us back to his law and say that my law will conform you by the spirit to the image that you might grow up into him who is the head. In other words, God does not just want to save us He desires to sanctify us and to make us look and sound and talk and use our time and view life as Jesus does. And one of the things that he does is with this new church that is Jew and Gentile, he does not give them some new laws. The case that I made to you several times is that what he actually does is go back to the Old Testament law. In other words, this new church, Jew and Gentile, that, that, that what's going to conform us is the gospel and the spirit and the word of God. And what Paul does is he goes back and he's pulling commandments. In other words, he's going to talk to children about honoring your parents. Well, that's one of the Ten Commandments. He's going to talk to us about sexual immorality. Well, guess what? One of the Ten Commandments is do not commit adultery. He's going to talk to us about our anger. Well, guess what? One of the Ten Commandments is do not murder. And this morning he talks to us about work. Because one of the Ten Commandments is thou shall not steal. That's exactly what he does in our passage. He listen to it one more time. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And so what you're learning about the law of God, when David could say it's absolutely beautiful, it is beautiful. That, that, that it encompasses not just what we're not to do. And so you see it all in Scripture, right? The Bible says do not commit adultery. But you have to know that the law of God is not just moving towards the act. Jesus says that adultery is a, is a sin of the heart. If you look at a woman with lustful intent, you've committed adultery in the heart. So look at how the law is deeper than we can imagine. But also think about this, that when the, the law prohibits something, It's simultaneously commanding something. And so the same law that says do not commit adultery on your husband or your wife, the same law is commanding that you date your wife, that you find delight in your husband. It's not just saying stop doing this. It's circling to the other side of the the, the pendulum and saying, "Okay, putting that off. 
Now put this on, right? It's not just saying do not be angry and do not murder. It's not enough to say don't do that. The law positively says value life. Speak words of life into people you care about. You get it? It's the same thing with our commandment this morning. Paul does not say thief, don't steal and pat yourself on the back if you're not stealing. Notice how the gospel girl goes even further. He says, don't steal and work. You see, the commandment in the Old Testament, do not steal, was just as much as a commandment to positively work. Therefore, the gospel touches how we do our work. It touches how we view our work. It touches what we do with the resources we get from our work. It touches why we're motivated to work. And that's what I want us to think through this morning is how does the gospel impact your work, beloved, and my work? I think the first thing I want us to think through is God's design for work. So if you want to take notes, that's kind of one little hanger, kind of hang some points on that. God's design for work. You got to understand if there is a commandment not to steal and you can insert whatever, a car, a house, food. If there's a commandment not to steal, well, then how do we get the car and the house and the food and the clothing? And the scriptures would say that how does God intend it is that, that we work, that we have jobs. And if God desires work, then work must be holy and pleasing. He never commands anything of us, beloved, that is not holy and righteous in his sight. From doing schoolwork to my children, to doing science for a project, to teenagers, to moms who work in the home, to husbands who go outside of the home to work, to those of you who grow, have a farm, who work in a company, who run a company, who are artists, who work in government, who are in therapy, who, who you name it, God says work is good. And, and yet, I think it's, easily, it's easy to dread tomorrow morning, right? It's easy to kind of work for the weekend. And if you look at the quote that I put in the bulletin as our reflection quote, I won't read it, but, but, but look at that and meditate on that. Uh, not now, but a little later. But I think we, we have bought into this mantra of our culture that, that I want to make as much money as I can and I want to do as little as I can and save enough of my money so that I can sit by the pool and drink mint juleps and, and travel the world while my money continues to grow. And here's the danger with that thinking is that it actually perpetuates a lie that work is something we are to run away from rather than something that we are to find delight in and run to. And so if you listen to the narrative of our culture, it says work is bad. It's not good. Do it so that you can live for the weekends. And the Bible offers us an entirely different perspective with how to view our work. Now, what I want to do is sort of show the worldview that Paul was up against and that the Jews were always pushing against. And I think our American mantra for work has more in um, in relationship to this. There's a, a, a mythological creation account and it's called the Enuma Elish. And it was found in Babylon in 700 B.C. And we think it's at least. 1,000 to 2,000 years older than that. And the case that I want to make to you is that our, our view of God and creation will say a lot about how we view ourselves and how we view work. And so listen to this Greek mythological. This is a mythological account. It's not real. But if you were a Babylonian, this is what your worldview would have been as it relates to work. Marduk is kind of the chief God. And when Marduk hears the words of the other little gods, complaining about having to work, he comes up with this plan to appease them. This is what he writes. This is what is written. Blood I will mass and cause bones to be. I will establish a savage and man his name shall be. Truly the savage man I will create and he shall be charged with the service of the gods that they might be eased from their work and I will change the ways of the gods forever. Now, if you grew up in Babylon, 
That was your creation account. That Marduk is the chief God. And your view of work hinged on this idea that the gods don't like to work and the gods created humans to be slaves to the gods so that the gods could offload their work to the humans so that they could just sit up and coast and chill. Now, if you grew up in Babylon, that was your worldview. That is what you thought. And it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? When you have country, I mean, nations like Egyptians who enslaved Israel, when you have Babylonians and Assyrians and Romans and Greeks who enslaved people, trace it back to their creation origin. Slavery is not just about a warped view of the image of God. It's also a warped view of work. Think about it. If work is not good, then I and, and the gods are enslaving me to do their work, then I will enslave someone else to do mine. It's, it's always rooted back into how we understand our God and creation. Now, if you were Jewish, you want to know how your Bible opens up? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the world was the world was formless and void. And so in day one, your God went to work and day two, your God went to work and day three, your God went to work and day four, your God went to work and day five, your God went to work and day six, your God made you and woman and your God invited you into the garden that he had already created. And he says, you are made in my image and you are not my slave. And work is good because I'm working and I'm inviting you to rule and I'm inviting you to subdue and I'm inviting you to have children and to spread my glory across the face of the earth. You're not a slave. I'm not off putting work on you because it's bad. I'm actually inviting you, beloved, to continue the work that I have been doing. That's why Jews could not own slaves. It was rooted back up into their view of creation. Work is good. And if work is good, I need to be doing it. You get it? That's God's design. Work is good because God works. Work in the home is good. Work outside the home is good. Dirty, sweaty, creative, chaos killing, order bringing, heart forming, energy draining work is good. Right now, the second thing we see is that that's God's divine design for work. Now, the second thing is that man's distortion of work. Even though we know all of that and even though that is true. Sometimes that does not seep into our hearts when Monday mornings work roll around. We dread getting out of the bed. We hate to see coworkers coming. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying I hate to see coworkers coming. I'm not I'm not. But I worked out. I worked outside of ministry for several years before ministry. So I, I'm kind of putting on my kind of pre ministry hat. Work is just hard, man. You know, it's just hard. How many of us walk into every Monday morning? I'm ready to go, right? I'm here to conquer and subdue and to rule. I'm all in. If you're really, really honest, that's not you, right? I think there's some distortion that happens. And I think we've distorted some things. I think work is difficult. And I think we see it and feel it. And so what I want to do is just work through some ways that I think we get work wrong. Now, here's the thing about sin, beloved. It's an equal opportunity offender. Right. Doesn't matter if you're woman or man. It doesn't matter if you're black or white or rich or poor. That when we all stand before the word of God, every single commandment, we all have to say I'm guilty. And so when you get to this commandment, let the thief among you no longer steal. Do not make this tragic mistake and think that Paul has the finger pointing to someone else in the room. Paul is saying, hey, we're, we, we all fall short of this, the glory of God. 
that, that, that every single commandment we break. And so it, it's no different when we come to do not steal. Let us not think that Paul is saying, hey, that person over there. No, what the gospel does is it points the finger back at me and you. And it says, hey, rather than think I'm talking about someone else, let's push a little bit and let's see, do you steal? And here's the thing, the case that I want to make to you, I think we all get work wrong. I think we can get it wrong with overworking. I think work can kind of become this false god and idol. And you've heard of people who would do almost anything to get their business off the ground, that they will, will do almost anything to climb up the corporate ladder. You've heard stories of people when, when they've been fired from their jobs, they don't even make it home. They go right to the car and take their lives in the car because their identity is so wrapped up into work. You've heard about companies who have to actually have seminars on work and life balance because so many of their senior VPs are on their fourth and fifth marriage because they're spending so much time at work that they're getting to the top. And guess what? Their kids don't like them. It's not enough to just do 50 and 60 hours at work. Because of the digital age we're in, work comes home. It's like this black hole where all we do is work, 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 work. No wonder the Lord says, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. On it you shall not do work. And you can always sniff out an idolatry of work if on the Sabbath day we'd rather work than be with God's people. You get it? Overworking, overworking. We break it with underworking. We might not steal an item from another, but Forbes magazine says that we regularly steal time from our employers by doing non-work things while we're on the clock. They believe that 1.5 to 3 hours per day, the average employee spends on non-related work stuff. Some estimate that employee theft, either of property or time, it costs companies $200 billion a year. As much as one third of the cost inside of your car, inside of your shoes, it's to compensate for theft in the marketplace. We were in Memphis a few weeks ago and we went to Gus's Fried Chicken, right? Who had Gus's? Raise your hand. All right. So we were on our way from Memphis and we went to Gus's to get some chicken and we walked into Gus's and man, it, it blew me away. I almost took a picture of it. But like there was a sign, there were, there were several signs in the restaurant. It says Gus's employees are not allowed to bring their cell phones, smart watches or iPads to work. If there is an emergency, have your family member contact the store directly and we will relay the message to you. If you are found with any of these devices, it will be instant termination. Now, here's I promise you, it was right there so everybody could see it. Why would Gus's do that? Because somebody going to be checking Instagram and burning up your chicken, right? <laughs> the underworking. The underworking, the tend to ride the clock. I must, I must check my Facebook and I'm going to write this and do this. And I got this chicken over here that's burning up. And what Gus is, is saying, you will not underwork in here. But we're guilty of it, right? Underworking. What about not working? Beating the system. Disability fraud, welfare fraud, right? It, it's real. One guy, man, he, he was getting disability for years he was legally blind and could not walk. That's at least what he told them. They caught that joker on a jet ski. <laughs> he had made $200,000 to the good and was running two companies. And they caught him on a jet ski on a lake. Disability fraud. Slavery. The Romans weren't the only ones to do it. The Egyptians weren't the only ones to do it. The Babylonians weren't the only ones to do it. Our American founders did it. And it's not just a sin with marring the image of God, beloved. It's also a warped view of work. Warped view of work. Dishonest work, occupations such as pornography or drug dealing 
or Ponzi schemes. They're all distortions of work. And notice what Paul says, don't steal and don't just work. He says, do honest work with your own hands. In other words, use your mind, your hands, your body, your intellect and do something and you do it with honesty. And so I grew up and how many of you know what, know what boosters are? All right. I had a few in my eight o'clock service. So we grew up before we went to the, met, to the Metro Center or North Park. We would stop by a booster's house. And a booster was a person who was a professional shoplifter. And that's what they did for a living. They had the fancy equipment. They could take off all the tags. They had the, the bags that were lined with metal on the inside and the outside was coated in, in a dealer's bag. And so you were walking out of dealers and it looks like you got merchandise that you paid for, but the metal, the metal coating inside the bag would not let the alarms go off. And so we would go to houses for boosters and we would buy a, 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 a $60 polo for $20. And it was wrong and it was theft. We were in college, we put the little dental floss around the quarters and put the quarters with the dental floss wrapped around them and we pushed them in there and we washed all of our clothes and got our same four quarters back and we circulated those quarters through the dorm, right? It's theft. It's dishonest work. Paul actually says later, he says, make the best use of your time. Paul left Timothy. Guess where Paul left Timothy? In Ephesus, I see some of y'all laughing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I was not a believer then. It was, it was trifling. I know, I know. I've repented. Um, but this command, beloved, was not just restricted to those who were doing things outside the home. Paul even says homemakers can steal. Now, you got to remember, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus. And when you read 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul's talking about this role for widows. If you were a widow in the early church and you did not have enough resources to take care of yourself, you could be enrolled and the church would come alongside of you and care for you. Now, notice what Paul has to say. He says, hey, man, refuse them younger chicks, right? He says, when their passions draw them away from Christ and they desire to marry, they incur condemnation, having abandoned their faith. And listen to what he says in 1 Timothy 5, 13. Besides that, they have learned to be idlers, those who refuse to work. And they go about from house to house and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. You know, you hear that? Paul says, don't put them on the roll. Don't pay for them. They're not working. They're stealing. They're going to steal from the church. Don't put them on the list. Let me tell you what type of woman to come alongside and to support. He goes on to say, you want to know who to support? The widows who have a reputation of good works, who have discipled people, raised children, practiced hospitality, washed the feet of saints, cared for the afflicted, and devoted herself to every good work. Do you hear what Paul is saying? It's OK to not work outside the home and work inside the home and still steal from God. You get it? It's not something that just men can do in corporate America. The sting of this commandment, family, is that we're all guilty. Getting work right and leaving it there and keeping it there is slippery. And there's a word for professional stealers. It's the word kleptomaniacs. And that is the same Greek word from thief in this passage and steal in this passage. It's klepto. And so Paul is saying, hey, we're all guilty. Everybody in this room, we're guilty of stealing. We're guilty of struggling with contentment at work, idolizing work watching Black Panther on the fire stick that's jailbroken and it ain't, it ain't even out of the movie theater yet, right? You get it? We all underwork, we overwork, we joylessly go about our work, we work for the weekends, we rob the company of time and then bring work home and then we steal time from our families, never truly able to rest why? Why do we all struggle with this? Because we have inherited a corrupt nature from our first parents. 
I don't have to teach my son to ride the clock. My son, when he gets old and gets a job, he's going to do it. And you've done it. And I've done it and I do it. Why? Because that sinful nature, God says work is good. And the rebellious part of me says, no, God says, do work honestly. And the rebellious part of me says, no, I want to circumvent that. God says, find joy in my work. No, I'm going to complain all the time. God says, rest from my work. No, I'm going to work when I should be resting. You have to understand that before this commandment to work and not steal is really good news, it's bad news. And we are all thieves. But there's good news. Jesus's deliverance. Paul has to tell the thieves in the church to stop stealing. This begs us to ask the question, well, why? On what grounds? If you have ever looked up the definition of kleptomania, it says that th sometimes there is no reason. It's sometimes we steal and it's not even out of need. It's, we just do it because there is something inside the hearts of a kleptomaniac. So how in the world can Paul say, hey, thief, stop stealing, but work. What power, what grounds can he say that? You know why he can say it, beloved? It's because Paul said it earlier. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And once you once walked, you were that. You were following the course of the world. You were following the prince of the power of the air who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And you were by your very nature children of wrath. But God, being rich in mercy on account of the great love with which he has loved us, he has made us alive in Christ. And so when Paul tells the thief to stop stealing, he is not just telling him to try harder. He is actually saying, homeboy, you have been brought with a price of the blood of Christ. The spirit of God is now in you and God is conforming you to his image and the spirit will help you put to deeds and put off thievery and put on getting a job. Now, here's the thing. Paul also says in Ephesians for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not according to your works. And so for Paul, we might work in the workplace. That is good. But there is one thing you cannot work and earn. And that is your salvation. Therefore, the work of salvation is a free gift for us, beloved. But do not make the mistake to think that it was free. Someone had to work for it. And someone had to work to save you. And in John, Jesus says, my father is always working. And I have come to do his work. You ever thought about how Jesus views Satan? Listen to what Jesus says about Satan. John chapter 10, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. You are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer in the beginning and he does not stand in truth. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is the, a liar and the father of lies. In the parable of the sower, Jesus says the evil one has come to work and he has sown these weeds in my garden. That you get the image, beloved, that when Jesus understood Satan, he understood him as the quintessential lawbreaker. Do not murder. Satan is a murderer. Do not steal. Satan is a thief. Do not lie. He is the father of lies. Do not do all of these things. And Jesus is saying he has worked to deceive and kill and destroy you. And I, beloved, am coming back to work and take back what's not his. And so Jesus understands his whole life and ministry as the one who has come to work and to rest when he needed to rest and to do all the things that God requires of you and I and to save you and to die for you 
and the work of giving you his spirit, the work of sealing you until the day of until salvation is complete. He is doing this work, beloved. He has done it. And here is the beautiful thing about Jesus. He never cheated the clock. In the final moments of his life, he did not sweat beads of sweat. He sweated blood. In the final moments of his life, he says, I thirst. As if he were saying, I am tired. Look at me. I have worked myself to death. He gives new meaning to the phrase, he worked himself to death. What the gospel says to you and I, beloved, is he worked himself to death on a cross. And you want to know where Jesus died? Between two thieves. Think about that. What was God up to with putting his own son to death on a cross who worked faithfully his entire life, that he would spend his last breathing moments on the earth next to two thieves. And one of the thieves looked to Jesus and believed. And Jesus says, you thief, you will be with me in paradise today. Beloved, that's you and I. Your savior looks to you from his cross, having obeyed and kept everything. And he looks to you and I and says, you thief who rides the clock, who overworks, who underworks, who buys boosted clothing, who does all of this. I look to you and I say, you're mine. That's the good news, beloved. The good news for thieves is that Christ has delivered us. And this changes everything. It changes how we now view work. We can now, because we have been saved by the work of Christ on the grounds of his merit, we can now go to work tomorrow with dignity. That's the last point, working with dignity. The gospel works on us and it changes how we go about our work. First thing is it changes us because we work out of a new identity, which means that nothing we add to our titles or names can improve on our status as sons and daughters. And nothing we lose in this earth can subtract from it because our identity is not in it. Madonna was interviewed in Vogue magazine, I mean, Vanity Fair in 1991, and listen to what she writes about this desire to find her identity in work. Nobody works the way that I work, and all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy. I'm always struggling with that fear. I push past one spell of it and discover myself as a special human being. And then I get on another stage and then I think I'm mediocre and uninteresting. And then I have to find a way to get myself out of that again and again. My driving life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre. And that's always pushing me, pushing me, because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended and it probably never will. There's another artist. Her name is Solange and she has a song called Cranes in the Sky. And in this song, she's talking about this struggle that these cranes in the sky were these cranes in Miami where she was living at the time and during the real estate bubble. And when it bursted that that the cranes overnight, they disappeared. And they came crashing down. And what she was saying was like, hey, 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 they're, they're building and building and building and building, but they're not really dealing with reality down here. And what she says is, hey, my life is like that. I'm up here building and building and building and trying to find my identity and work. And my life is crashing. Listen to what she writes. I tried to drink it away. I tried to put one in the air. I tried to dance it away. I tried to change it with my hair. I ran my credit card up. 
thought a new dress would make it better. I tried to work it away, but that just made me sadder. I tried to keep myself busy. I ran around circles, think I made myself dizzy. I tried to run it away. Thought then my head be feeling clearer. I traveled 70 states. Thought moving around make me feel better. I tried to let go of my lover. Thought if I, if I was alone, then maybe I could recover. I tried to write it away and cry it away. It's like cranes that crash from the sky. You know who Solange is? It's Beyonce's sister. And she's interviewed and she's talking about living as the youngest person in the Knowles household and making an identity for herself. And she says, I tried everything. I've tried everything. I'm working and producing and running and changing my hair and doing everything. And she says, it all crashed down. There is good news for Madonna and Solange and for people like you and me. You don't have to prove anything with your work. You don't have to prove anything with your success. You have an identity in Jesus that is yours. He looks at you and he finds delight in you. And your work is not ultimate. It's good, but your ultimate identity is in Christ. And you're free from that treadmill of forging an identity by what you do and how much money you make and what title you have behind your last name. You work, we work out of a new identity as sons and daughters. We go about our work in a new way. Paul says, do work, do honest work with your own hands. And that word for honest, it's morally acceptable or good. Work that isn't destructive in nature. Work that adds value and goodness to our world. Good work, according to God, does not have to be significant work according to the world, but good. And the sky is the limit. Planting gardens is good. Shaping young minds through education is good. Serving pies at a pie shop and enabling families to taste the sweetness of God around their kitchen table is good. Cleaning up a building so that students can come in and, and, and move about in cleanliness, it's good. Cleaning up little messes at home, it's good. Taking the chaos in your little kid's heart and making something orderly and, 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 and for the glory of God, it's good. Making a latte that your pastor stops by and gets on a, on a, on a busy day that gives me this boost of caffeine. It is good doing art and showcasing your creativity. It is good fighting fires to rescue life. It is good treating the human body. It is good treating the human soul. It is good sharing the gospel with teenagers. It is good going out into government and passing good legislation. It is good. Beloved, the sky is the limit. What Paul is saying, do good work. Taking care of your ailing parents. It's good. It's all good. Last thing Paul says is we work out of this sense of new priorities. Christianity isn't unique in calling its followers to work. There's some cultures where thieves get their hands cut off if they're caught stealing. So to say that they... They're, they're instigating, right? They're, they're putting forth this image that work is good. And if you're caught stealing, we cut your hand. But here's the thing about Christianity. Paul does not just say don't steal. He does not just say work, honestly, do good work. He moves the pendulum even farther. And he says work that you might have something to share with those in need. Do you see the gospel pendulum? It's just not about not stealing. It's just not about holding a job down. It's also about working that you might be generous. Where the world says to you that we work 
so that we can stack our bread. The gospel says you work that you might share it. Where the world says we work to see how much we can gain. The gospel says you work that you might give. The gospel says that work isn't about primarily growing wealth, but learning to be generous with what you have. And this means something. This means that there is an economy, beloved, that's out there that we can't see. And you don't get you can't go trade for it on the stock market. Right. Jesus says that there is this economy where you can sow things now and, and you can build treasures up there where malls can't get to and thieves can't steal. See the language? Thieves can't steal it. They can't touch it. He, he's pulling the veil back and he is saying, beloved, you can do business now on this earth that echoes into eternity forever. Through your generosity. Now, think about what this means. I think we approach Ephesians as if this church was just diverse along ethnic lines, Jew and Gentile. But there's also some other diversity in this church. And it's rich and poor. That this verse assumes that some of you will be sitting on the pew with someone who got 250,000 in the account right now. And you got two dollars. Notice what he says. Let the one work with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Who are the needy in this congregation? It's probably the smallest of kids. That's why we have labor laws. Right. My son does not need to go work in a factory at age eight. You know, he just he needs his daddy to go to work. And that's cool. I go to work and I think about providing. Some of you are beyond your years in working and you're living on a fixed income and you would have been in that segment of the population. Some of you are single mothers and you're desperately trying to make ends meet and you're sitting across the row from somebody who has enough. The question that we have to ask of this text, how did Paul expect the most vulnerable in the congregation to be cared for? He does not say, let him go see the government. He says, look at your brother and sister right next to you. Now, I'm not anti-government. I'm not. I think it's really good. I, I, I get it. I'm not, I'm not trying to have that conversation. That's for another arena. But what we cannot say is that the early church did not feel wedded to one another. And that when there was someone in need within the body of Christ, you know where they went first and not second. To the church. To the church. We believe that God is sovereign over salvation. God is also sovereign over bringing the poor and the rich into the same fellowship. He's sovereign there. There's a guy by the name of Julian, the apostate, and he wasn't a he committed apostasy and he tried to stamp out Christianity single handedly. And as he breathed his last breath, you want to know what he said? Oh, you Galilean, you have defeated me. You know what Galilean he was talking about? Jesus. And you want to know why he felt defeated by Christ? Because every time he tried to stamp out Christianity, every time Christians were poor, every time plague swept through his part of the world, when the world was kicking the poor out, when the world was throwing the poor aside, it was the church. It was the church coming alongside of not just their own, but the people in the neighborhood around them. It was the church being generous and the church grew and grew and grew so much so that as this man died, oh, you Galilean, you got me. And you know how Jesus got him? Through getting the hearts of the church, being generous. We work with a higher priority. So I love this church. You might not know it, 
you have buried people who did not have life insurance. And our deacons won't tell you who and won't tell you how much. You've paid light bills. You put new roofs on homes. You've come alongside single mothers in their time of need. You supported missionaries who are ministering all over the world. And I want to say thank you. And I want to push us even farther to work, not just to recruit wealth, but to be generous. So go to work this week, beloved, whether in the home or the office, with this renewed understanding, your work is important. Christ is your identity. You don't need to prove anything to anyone. Dishonest work, we need to talk about it, right? Let's pursue something better. Single moms, I see you. Let us know how to love you better. Children, when your dads come home after a hard days of work providing for those who need them, give them a hug and tell them thank you. Husbands, when you get home and your wife has been holding the house down, get her some roses and hug her and give her a kiss and say, I see you. I see Jesus working in you. It's my prayer is that we would work a different way. Let's pray. Father, we give our time to you and pray that you would conform us more to your image. Thank you for the righteousness of Christ in which we rest in. Thank you that we can approach this passage with humility. We are all guilty, all guilty of breaking this commandment. And yet for those who have placed faith in you, we are all counted righteous in your sight. Father, I pray that your spirit, the spirit of Christ, would rule in our hearts and continue to do the mighty work of transformation until you bring us home. Make us look like Jesus and make us appealing Make Jesus undeniable to those that we love and serve and care for. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.